Well, at first glance, uh, the readings for today might be misconstrued as a treatise on food. The gospel according to Julia Child, Rachel Ray, or Paula Dean. Anybody here not recognize one of those names? Be honest. All right. Okay. Well, the first reading from Isaiah speaks of, quote, a feast of rich food and choice wines. And St. Paul in the second reading says he has, quote, learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry. And the gospel, of course, relates the well-known parable of the wedding banquet. Now, as with all scripture, one needs to go deeper into the meaning of the text with both head and with heart. We need to study and to increase our understanding of how the text was written, for what purpose, and for what audience. Now, equal, and perhaps of more importance, is for our hearts to be open to the transforming power of the Word of God. Now, our ability to do either is, of course, limited by who we are as human beings. St. John of the Cross taught that we, as believers, have a finite idea about the infinite God. Now, think about that. We, with our finite minds, are attempting to understand the infinite God. It seems to me that that puts us at a great disadvantage when left to our own devices. So we pray for the power and the grace that's necessary to move beyond our human limitations. Now, having said that, I'm going to attempt to explain what I think God is saying to us in today's readings which is presumptuous of me at best and stupid of me at worst. But here we are. And fortunately, I've had the opportunity to read what others who are way, way smarter than me and way, way nearer to God than I am, what, I think of, what they think about these matters. Well, for me, the key phrases that jump out of today's readings are found in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul says, He's learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of living in abundance and living in need. And that's a direct quote. Now, let's be honest. If given a choice, who would prefer to go hungry rather than be well-fed? Who would choose being poor over being rich? Who would choose illness over infirmity or over choose illness or infirmity over good health. Those of you who are students, who would choose getting an F or a D on a test or a term paper over a B or an A? And while we have some power of choice, the reality is that none of us escapes what we experience as negative in this life. So for most of us, life is a mixed bag. And like St. Paul, we sometimes seem to be living in abundance of some kind, and sometimes we seem to be living in need of some kind. So what's the secret that Paul alludes to that enables him to accomplish this, to be at peace and to be happy whether we are living in abundance or living in need? Now, unlike the other apostles, Paul never knew the human Jesus of Nazareth. But like the other apostles, Paul encountered the risen Jesus, the cosmic Christ. And that same kind of a encounter is promised to all of us. But what does that mean? What is this encounter? What does it look like? How is it experienced? What is its essence? There are so many of our heroic mothers and fathers in faith who came to the realization that union with the divine is our destiny. Now, according to a writer whose name is James Finley, writing on St. John of the Cross, he says, St. John of the Cross believed that, quote, substantial union is our God-given, godly nature. And in paraphrasing the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that I think you know well, love is patient, love is kind, Finley correctly states that the only thing that really lasts is love itself. Matter of fact, he says that outside of love, nothing really exists. So the task, if you will, is to determine the most loving thing I can do at the present moment for myself, for this particular person, for this particular community of people, 
for the earth and for all earth's creatures. And the mystic lady Julian of Norwich wrote that the love of God creates in us a union that when truly understood makes us realize that no person can separate themselves from another person. And then Thomas Merton, the monk, had a mystical experience of union that's so beautifully articulated, I really need to share it with you in his own words to do it credit. So bear with me if you would. This is what he wrote. He's in Louisville, Kentucky on a shopping trip from the monastery. And he, he writes, in Louisville at the corner of Wal Fourth and Walnut in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, a spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. The whole illusion of a separate difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. I had the immense joy of being human, a member of a race in which God became incarnate, as if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me now that I realize what we all are. And if only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There's no way of telling people that they are walking around shining like the sun. Then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts. The depths of their hearts were neither sin, nor desire, nor self-knowledge can reach. The core of their reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes. If only they could see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other that way all the time. There would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. Now, if we take to heart what John of the Cross, St. Paul the Apostle, Julian of Norwich, Thomas Burton, countless others have said, we gradually come to an awareness of what Jesus actually taught. And that is that union with God and all of God's creation, including all human beings, is the secret to happiness. And that's the secret that enabled Paul as well as all of us, to live joyfully, whether we live in abundance or we live in need. Now, unfortunately, the teachings of Jesus have been so terribly distorted by our established religions that condone and support exclusion and judging of others, exploitation of people, and control of their members through shame and guilt. And this is so, so far from the kind of inclusive, compassionate, forgiving kingdom that Jesus envisioned. But as previously stated, the only thing that lasts is love itself, because that is the very nature of God, which is the very nature of reality. And as John the Evangelist wrote, those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as Jesus put it in John's Gospel, he came to us so that we could be one with him and one with each other as Jesus is one with his Father, whom he also taught us to call our Father. So that's the secret. Choose love over hate. Choose unity over exclusion and division. Then it really doesn't matter so much what we have or what we don't have. It simply becomes unimportant. Because in a manner of speaking, all that which seems so important to us is simply an illusion. The wealth we might accumulate, the power and prestige that we might attain, our jobs, our professions, the good health we might enjoy, our youth and vitality, nothing of that sort lasts forever. And there's much wisdom in the old saying, you can't take it with you. Father Richard Rohr has something to say relative to living a life in which there is seeming good and seeming bad, where there is sometimes abundance and sometimes scarcity. Now, many of us wonder at times where God is when we're in need. This is what Rohr has to say. If we are absolutely grounded in the absolute love of God that protects us from nothing, even as it sustains us in all things, 
It grounds us to face all things with courage and tenderness. End quote. Now that makes sense to me. If we're realistic, we have to acknowledge that God does not protect us from all the bad things in life, even when we fervently pray for ourselves or for those we love. Right? Yet our faith tells us that God will sustain us, even in the face of deprivation and tragedy. And remember that faith is not just about believing dogmas and following rules. It's more about following the one whom we can trust, because he lived a life that ended in rejection, betrayal, and a cruel death. Yet, God sustained him in his trials and raised him in glory. Jesus shows us the way. It's up to us to follow him. And it is in following Jesus, the one who called himself the way, that leads us to the, the one thing that does last. And that is who we are in the eternal God. Who we are as members of the body of Christ. Who we are in the love of God in which each of us is a very unique manifestation. Or in other words, namely the words of St. Paul in his letter to the Colossians, it is who we are as people who are, quote, hidden with Christ in God. When all is said and done, the love that we are is our true nature, and it really is all that lasts. Now, a prayer written by Father Richard Rohr, whom I quoted earlier, eloquently states what I'm trying to share with you, but frankly, I have feel I don't have the right words to convey it. So I'll read what he has to say, this short prayer. Oh God, we are one with you. You have made us one with you. You have taught us that if we are open to one another, you dwell in us. Help us to preserve this openness and to fight for it with all our hearts. Help us to realize that there can be no understanding where there is mutual rejection. O oh God, in accepting one another wholeheartedly, fully, completely, we accept you. And we thank you and we adore you and we love you with our whole being because our being is in your being. Our spirit is rooted in your spirit. Fill us then with love and let us be bound together with love as we go our diverse ways, united in this one spirit which makes you present in the world and which makes you witness to the ultimate reality that is love. Love is overcome. Love is victorious." End quote. We hold the treasure not made of gold, in earthen vessels wealth untold. One treasure only, the Christ the Lord, in earthen vessels. Oh uh -huh.